Well, shalom, shalom, welcome, welcome, world changers. Back for another night, back at it tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to get into uh, the book of Philippians, or uh, the epistle of Paul to the Philippians. Uh, that is, uh, there's a, it's, a, it's actually a toss-up between Philippians and, and Galatians, between the scholars of which one was written first. So uh, we're going to be doing Philippians, Lord willing, tonight, and tomorrow would be Galatians. Oh, the Galatians, the Galatians. We'll get into that tomorrow. So make sure you let uh, everyone know, especially your Galatians-loving uh, family or friends, and uh, we'll have a wonderful discussion, and of course tonight as well, with the book of uh, Philippians. So if you know of anyone who is interested, please let them know. Anyone that might be interested, let them know. All right. So um, yes, 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 yes. It's been uh, it's been busy for me around here. So um, all right. Philippians, 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 we'll get into Philippians in just a moment. Let me just see what's going on in the live chat before we do. So we have Kalamento says, Shalom, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Kalamento. It's good to see you. Tammy says, Shalom, all. Shalom, Tammy. Welcome. Blessings, blessings. Vinny says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Vinny. Blessings, brother. Good to see you. Going nowhere says, Hey, Chris. Sending a virtual hug your way. Also sending virtual hugs to anyone here who needs them. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And good to see you going nowhere. Hope everything is going uh, well with you. Uh, the Great Deception says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Alan. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay, so the, the book of Philippians. Um, <laughs> going nowhere says... Philippians, that rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? So the book of Philippians, uh, I'm going to start reading right away here. And I, I want to, I, I, I noticed something just a matter of hours ago that I've never noticed before. I'll let you guys know. I'll let you guys hot off the press. There's something that I have found uh, in just studying this stuff. That I've never seen this before, but let's let's get into this. Philippians chapter one. Oops, pulled up the wrong screen. Excuse me. Philippians chapter one. Here we are, right here. All right. Philippians chapter one, verse one. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus uh, who are at Philippi with the overseers and servants, grace to you. And peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so notice, Paul does not claim to be an apostle here. He does not open this up as an apostle. Like, how, for example, let's go over to um, Romans, okay? So Romans, you will see here, Paul, a servant of Jesus, Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. And then you got um, 1 Corinthians, he gets even... Uh, more blunt here, Paul called to be an apostle, okay? Uh, and um, now the other letters, like the later letters, or, you know, like again, a lot of the scholars don't believe that 1 Timothy uh, was written by Paul, but notice how it's, it, it starts here, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. So notice there is a progression here. There is a progression from Paul not, not claiming to be an apostle at all, to all of us, like, through the chronology, as it were, of the letters of Paul, uh, cl not claiming to be apostle at all, you know, in First Thessalonians, like we read last night, let me just just to confirm it with you guys, go over to uh, First Thessalonians, uh, Paul, Salvanus, and Timothy to the ascent. So there's no like Paul and apostle, like like we, like we see in the in in the other letters, okay, the later letters or the disputable letters, as some scholars would call them. Uh, so Paul doesn't mean that he, he doesn't claim to be an apostle here. Okay, um, Philippians is arguably the the next one that Paul wrote doesn't claim to be an apostle. Okay, now Galatians. That's just as we're looking at this here. Galatians. Oh, there he is. Like just right up, boom. Paul, an apostle. Okay. Um, and again, so, 
Yeah, so it's interesting that the first two books, First Thessalonians and Philippians, Paul starts off in a more of a humble note, if you if you would say, more of a humble note there. I did not notice that um, until just a matter of hours ago, actually. As a, and you know, this is the beauty of going through the uh, the books um, in chronological order, especially in the in the order they were written. Ophiz says, Shalom Israel, Shalom everyone, Shalom Ophiz, good to see you, welcome, welcome. So, let's continue here, Philippians. Um, that's Thessalonians, it says Philippians up top here, but it's Thessalonians. Uh, wait a second, this is playing, uh, this thing here, hold on a second, see if I can. Okay, so that's Thessalonians. So that's Philippians. Okay. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and servants, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Again, Paul is at a more of a humble tone here, coming in, not, you know, and Paul an apostle, but rather Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Verse 3. I thank my God whenever I remember you. Well, that's nice of you, Paul. Again, let's keep this in mind. A lot of people uh, read this as if as if God is actually talking to them today. I mean, God does use uh, you know uh, these kind of uh, writings to to speak to us. Um, however, not as 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 uh, as most uh, evangelical uh, Christians would would have you believe in that every single word is actually God speaking to you today. Uh, Paul is actually talking to some of the believers that he met and knew at Philippi. Uh, and he's writing here a follow-up letter uh, to uh, basically follow up on his uh, relationship with them and his visit with them and his friendship, uh, and so on and so forth. I thank my God whenever I remember you always in every request of mine on behalf of, of you all making my request with joy for your partners your partnership in in furtherance of the good news from the first day until now being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ it is even right for me to think this this way on on behalf of uh, of all of you because i have you in my heart because both in, in my bonds, okay, he's talking about actually being like in jail, basically, and in the defense and uh, the confirmation of the good news, or a lot of other uh, translations would say the gospel, or yeah, gospel. By the way, I am at this point, I am reading from the World English Bible. Uh, you, you all are partakers with me of grace, for God is my witness, how I long after all of you in the tender mercies of Christ Jesus. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all discernment, so that you may prove the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Again, what's this mean, the day of Christ? This would be judgment day. Being, full, uh, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Ah. I like that. Being filled with the fruits of not just the idea of being, quote unquote, clothed with the righteousness of Christ, but rather being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I desire to have you know, brothers, that the things which happened to me have turned out rather to the progress of the good news so that it became evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my bonds are in Christ and that most of the brothers in the Lord being confident through my bonds are more abundantly bold to speak the word of God without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even out of envy and strife and some also out of goodwill. The former insincerely preach Christ from selfish ambi ambition, thinking that they add an affliction to my chains. 
but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the good news. But what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. I rejoice in this. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out to my salvation through your supplication and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will in no way be disappointed, but with all boldness as always, now, now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, let's just spend a second here. Um, so Paul is basically saying here in Philippians chapter 1, uh, let's see, we'll start well, this whole, this whole uh, paragraph actually from verse 12 to verse 20, basically saying, you know, some people preached Christ, you know, just for gain or, you know, for, just for selfish ambition, like maybe for, um, uh, maybe to uh, boost their, their status in, in, uh, you know, their, their social status or something like that. Uh, they preach Christ uh, just to make themselves look good, basically, or they preach uh, Christ out of envy and strife. But Paul is saying here, uh, you know, you know, he's like, it doesn't matter as long as Christ is or Christ is preached. Um, I, I used to really uh, rely on this. I remember years ago when people would badmouth certain preachers and preachers that God actually used in my walk in my, in my life, and they would badmouth uh, preachers. And I would I would always bring up something like this, where they say, "Well, you know, it says in the Bible, in Philippians chapter one, it doesn't matter even if it is as selfish ambition or for you know personal gain or whatever." If these people preach Christ, hey, it's, praise God, they're preaching Christ. As long as they're preaching Christ. But, you know, now I'm, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, uh, you know, it's it's important uh, to, to, uh, to, to preach Christ in honest, in honesty and not in, you know, not with hypocrisy. So, um, you know, I, I, the way I stand right now is if you want to preach Christ or if you if you are preaching Christ, you should be living the holy life. You should be living the holy life. You should be doing it for the right reasons, for the right motive. Um, which is not really what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying as long as Christ is preached, it really doesn't matter. He's like, praise God anyway. That's basically what he's saying here. So... That's kind of debatable in a way. Um, verse 21. For to, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what does this mean? Um, there would be other, there'd be certain, there'd be different ways of interpreting this. What this means to me would be for, uh, Paul says, for to me, uh, to me, to live is Christ. Meaning that uh, he uh, his goal is to be like Yeshua. So to live is to be like um, a reflection or a representation or rep representative of Yeshua. Um, that's what I get from to live is Christ. And not only that, but that you know to live in a way where uh, Yeshua, you're following him. You're always thinking about his teachings. You're always... Uh, going by um, his example, you know, you're always keeping him in your mind. And Paul says to die is gain. In other words, well, if I die, I'm okay anyway. You know, I'll just gain. I'll just gain heaven, basically, in in uh, modern speak. Verse twenty two. But if I live on in the flesh, right? So he's talking about biological life. This will bring f fruit. From my work, yet I don't know what I will choose. What do you mean? You know what you will choose? And this is a, this is kind of in this is kind of um, 
weird that he would say, yet I don't know what I would choose. Um, but I'm in a dilemma between the two, having the desire to depart to be with Christ. It's, it's almost like, like what, are, what are you talking about, Paul? Are you, are you saying that you can choose to die right now and to be with Christ? Like, what are, what are you saying, Paul? Um, but I'm in, I'm in a dilemma between the two, having the desire to, uh, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Now, I know some people could interpret this to mean, well, Paul is really just saying, if I could choose, if I would choose, if I had to choose, I don't know what I would choose if God gave me the choice, basically. So that's that's more of a positive way to look at it. But it, it is kind of weird the way this is worded here. Verse 24, yet to remain in the flesh is more needful for your sake. In other words, I'm not living, uh, I'm not living for me, I'm living for you. Uh, having this confidence, I know that I will remain, yes, and remain with you all for your progress and joy in faith, that your, re that your rejoicing may abound in Christ Jesus in me through my presence with you again. Verse 27, only let your way of life be worthy of the good news of Christ. So, or the gospel of Christ. And again, this is good. This is good stuff. I like this. Um, let your way of life, let, let your lifestyle be worthy of God, basically. Be worthy of the gospel. Be worthy of the word of God. That whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your state that you stand firm in one spirit with one soul, striving for the faith of the good news, and in nothing frightened by the adversaries, which is for them a proof of destruction, but to you of salvation, and that from God. Because it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer on his behalf, having the same con conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me very interesting Let's see here alan says my prayer for many years was father let me be more like yeshua in the 90s then i started questioning why don't we keep the fourth command hmm yeah it has been growing exponentially since. I still pray that. Yeah, amen. Amen. Absolutely. You know, and, and when I talk to when I talk to Christians who are not like they tot they totally throw away the Torah. Like, oh, we don't have to do any of the commandments. It's not by the works of, of the flesh, it's only by faith in Jesus. And when I bring that concept to them, where it's like, okay, so WWJD, what would Jesus do? Or, you know, you pray, and most Christians that I know, at least honest Christians, serious Christians, you know, they pray that they're more like Christ. And we know that Christ, or we know that Yeshua was at least, at the very least, um, Torah observant, okay, in that sense. So it baffles me right now. It really baffles me when I talk to people that are not Torah observant and they say they want to be Christ-like. And they say, you know, it's all about being Christ-like, you know, that the, the ultimate goal is to be like Christ. Well, I don't see how they can't connect. I don't see where, like, where do they lose the logic here? Where do they lose it? And it's like, um, he obeyed the commandments. If you if you obey the commandments more, you will be more like him. I mean, see, it's a very simple concept, but it just doesn't seem to compute. Like how my grandmother used to say, "Does not compute, doesn't register, doesn't register." Ellen says exactly, uh, "Walk as he walked." Exactly, yeah, exactly. So let's continue. Philippians chapter two. If there is, therefore, let me just try to zoom in a little bit more here. This might be a little bit better for you guys to read, especially if you're on mobile devices. 
If there is therefore any exhortation in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassion, make my joy full. Again, Paul is talking to the people in Philippi in his day. He's not talking to us, although, again, we can we can learn some stuff here. Uh, he says, make my joy full by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of, and of one mind. Doing nothing through rivalry or through conceit, but in humility, each counting others better than himself. Each of you not just looking to his own things, but each of you also to the things of others. Good advice, Paul. Uh, Verse 5. Have this in your mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who exists in the form of God, didn't consider equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Now, what does it mean here, form of God? Well, we know that God made man in his image. I mean, that's one thing you could say. But he, it says he didn't consider equality with God to uh, a thing to be grasped. And I know that there are some translations who word this differently, but I mean, what do, what do Trinitarians do with this? What do they do with this? Verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, uh, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, yes, the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him. Okay, so we got two different people here. We got God and him. God highly exalted him and gave to him the name which is above every name that at at the name of Jesus, every knee, knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, let's talk about this for a little bit. Um, so we have to take this in concept, or I mean, I mean excuse me, in, in context. We have to take this in context. Who's speaking here? This is Paul. Who's Paul? He's a guy who never met Jesus in the flesh. As far as we know, he never met Jesus. He was not trained with, he was not trained, hands-on training, face-to-face. He wasn't trained by Jesus like the 12 were. He didn't go through the school, you know, where traditionally it's believed that the 12 disciples were with Jesus for like three, three and a half years, three to four years like a university program, hands-on, living with the with the professor and in learning from Yeshua face to face. They were they were enrolled in the in the course. Paul wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't there. He came in late. And we'll get to uh 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He uh he he he, he he admits this. He came in late. He, as he says, he's like one born out of due time. It's like he he missed it. He missed it. So you got to ask the question: Where did he get this information from? And I know a lot of Christians would say that, oh, well, the you know, he got it from the Spirit of God. He God showed him all this stuff. Well, where did he say that? I mean, honest question. I'm not saying yay or nay here. I'm just asking a question. Where did he say that? If you read the prophets, for example, the prophets are quite clear. You know, God showed me, or, you know, the word of the Lord came to me, you know, or a vision came to me in the night, and this is what I saw, or, you know, it's, it's clear how they got their word. It's clear how they got their, their revelation. Some books of the Bible are not so clear. This is one good example here. Paul is not very clear here. Where did he get this from? Is this this just his point of view? This is what he he discerns somehow? He doesn't say. I don't think he got this from the 12, any of the 12 disciples. And I think tomorrow when we read the, the shocking book of Revelation, or excuse me, Galatians, when we when we read tomorrow the shocking book of Galatians, I say shocking because there are some shocking things in there. 
Um, he pretty much brags that he didn't spend much time at all with, with any of the original 12 disciples. Why he brags like that, I don't know. Um, I mean, he says, you know, I, I, I didn't get my revelation from man. I got it from God, but okay. We need to take this in context. And the context here is a man who did not walk and talk with Jesus in the flesh, a man who came in late, a man who mu- uh, missed the bus, basically. And, and he's saying this stuff. He's saying this stuff. Now, he's he gets some of this stuff from the Tanakh, okay? Uh, every knee should bow, okay? So let's say we just take this here, uh, this phrase, every knee should bow. And uh, well, let's just, um, yeah, let me see what we're going to do here. Let's go over to Blitter Bible and look up that phrase, every knee should bow. Uh, well, we get to come here. Um, I'm thinking it's in... It is in, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, it is in Isaiah. Every knee should bow. Isaiah. This is probably right here, Isaiah 45. Okay, so he is taking stuff. Okay, yeah, so this is it right here. And and so um, Isaiah is very clear here when he wrote this that it's actually God speaking through Isaiah. Like, you know, I have sworn by myself. This is uh, the Lord's, you know, the verse, um, the verse before. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. So Isaiah wrote this, but God is speaking in the first person here. Uh, I am God and there is none out, none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out from my from my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say in the Lord, I have righteousness and strength. Every, even to him shall men come and in all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Okay, so you see how Paul does this quite often in his in his uh in his epistles what he does is he 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 cuts it's like he i don't know it's like he gets a, a pair of scissors and he and he cuts out just certain parts of certain verses and he splices them together and he interpolates his own word in there and this is exactly what he did here so he got that that whole thing, you know, and to me, every, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, every, every tongue shall swear. He gets that from Isaiah chapter 45, 23. However, he interpreted it, like, in, in, excuse me, in interpolated, he padded it with other things. Like he said that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying yea or nay to this. I'm just bringing this out as a fact. Paul does this. He takes um, not even verses, like part verses of the Tanakh, he cuts them out and he pads them with his own words. Okay. Again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying his words are true or false. I'm just saying this is what he does. Verse 12. This is Philippians 2, verse 12. So then, my beloved, even as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Ah, now, again, you see, in in the first epistle that he wrote, if the scholars are, are correct, uh, First Thessalonians, he doesn't go in, he doesn't go on about, hey, guys, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, it, it's not about works of the law, it's not about, you know, obedience, it's just faith, that's it. Look at Abraham. You know, he didn't, he didn't go on about that at all. He didn't mention anything about the faith, you know, sola fide doctrine, all this kind of stuff. It's just a, 
it's a letter. It's actually, it's, 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 I can't, it's not, it's a pretty good letter actually in first Thessalonians as a, a letter of encouragement. Although he thought that Jesus would come back in his lifetime, obviously, which didn't happen. Uh, but he said it would, but it didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, here again, you don't see this kind of rhetoric where he's like against the law or against obedience to the law, or, you know, you know, he's just, he's just, he says a lot in Philippians about this kind of stuff about, um, obe obedience, you know, you know, you, you, uh, you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation, your own salvation with fear and trembling. <sighs> Okay, I mean that's good, but I mean, <laughs> wait until we get to uh, Galatians. Wait till we get to Galatians. You'll see a, a different side of of Paul. But I mean, it, did Galatians did something happen between Philippians and Galatians where Paul, for lack of a better word, flipped? <laughs> he got I don't know what happened. He or, or, or snapped. I don't know. Paul snapped or. I, it seems like Galatians is is so different than this. This is one of the problems with having a Bible canon. When you read each one of these letters, you think that it's all just part of, like it is all put together in one book, right? But it's misleading because you don't see the context of it, like how we're doing, how we're reading through this. First Thessalonians was written separately. And it was sent to us to different people, to a certain people. Philippians was written separately too. Paul didn't write these, these uh, books to be in the Bible. Never thought of it being in the Bible. He read, he wrote them as letters of encouragement and exhortation to fellow believers um, that he met and uh, had a relationship with. So, When we read things like 1 Thessalonians and Philippians, a lot of Christians, don't. it doesn't come to their mind, hey, this is a whole lot different than Galatians. Because they think it's all part of the same book, but it's really not. It's separate. Paul didn't say anything to the Philippians like he said to the Galatians, generally speaking. Psalm 94 says, Shalom to all. Shalom, Psalm 94. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Blessings. Alan says, weird thing. Paul says he learned from Jesus in the desert. Yeshua said, when they say he's in the desert, don't go. I am not there. Paraphrase. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that one as well. Ezekiel says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Ezekiel. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. Blessings. Pat asked a question here. When was Paul placed above the disciples that Jesus handpicked? Was there a shift in the history of Christianity? Very good question, Pat. I appreciate it. Thank you for asking. He was first placed above the rest, the other disciples or above the disciples, because he really wasn't a disciple, really. Disciple means student, right? So the 12 were students. They, they again, it's like they took the course. They lived, it's like they lived at, like it's the, the dorm, okay? They, they were living there at the school. They, they were with Yeshua, the professor, the, the rabbi, the teacher. Uh, you know, they say three and a half, four, three and a half years, give or take. Uh, they went through the course. They were, they were, you know, formal students, disciples, where Paul wasn't. So, yeah, he wasn't a disciple. But, yes, he was placed above the disciples at a certain point. Historically speaking, the first person that did this in that they took Paul's um, teachings, his um his doctrine, and they placed it above the other disciples. It was done by a man by the name of Marcion. M-A-R-C-I-O-N. 
Marcion. And uh, what he did, uh, he lived in the second century. He was the first one to craft out what they called, uh, the first one to actually make a quote unquote New Testament compilation of books. What he did was he took um, the letters of Paul, um, not all of them, there, but the, the majority of the ones that we, we say today are the authentic letters of Paul. Again, for those of you who are new here, uh, I think it's important to understand that most scholars believe that out of the 13 letters or the 13 epistles of Paul in the New Testament today, only seven of those 13 are thought to be authentic. The other six are not authentic. Most scholars believe that. Some scholars believe that they are authentic. I mean, you know, uh, but most scholars believe they're not authentic, meaning that they were forged. They were written in the name of Paul, but not, it wasn't Paul that wrote it. So, um, uh, let me see here. Uh, give me a second. So Marcion was the first one to take Paul's writings, put it together, compile it, and they he took the Gospel of Luke as well, although it's not exactly the same. It, it's a different. It's it's different than our uh, Gospel of Luke. Very similar, but different. He there's some things that that were changed. But he took Luke and the and the uh, the letters of Paul, put them together, and made the first so-called New Test or New Testament, and he held that above all others. He held that above um, James, above you know Peter, above anybody. He claimed to be uh, uh, a disciple of Paul. It's important to understand that Marcion was was arguably the first, or one of the first, or one of the greatest heretics. Uh, that has ever plagued the church. Uh, most of the um, early church fathers uh, denounced him as a heretic. In fact, uh, there were church fathers, uh, Justin Martyr uh, and other uh, church fathers, Polycarp. Uh, we have, um, I think it was Ira Irenaeus as well, as far as I can remember, where they actually said that Marcion was full of the devil or he was possessed he had the de he had the devils in his in his uh, on it, in in his mouth on his tongue. Um, Polycarp called him the a son of Satan. It's interesting that what the early church fathers denounced as demon possessed and a son of Satan is the first one who uh, elevated Paul above all above all excuse me above all others. Uh, Marcion is the one that cut out the so-called Old Testament too. In fact, arguably I've heard that uh, Marcion is the one that actually even coined it as Old Testament. To come to think about it, uh, if, if you and I were to go back in time, if we were to get into a time machine, go back in time to the days of the book of Acts, to the days when Peter and James were, you know, in Jerusalem and and if we were to talk to them and if we were to call uh, talk to them about the Old Testament, I'm pretty sure they would say, what are you talking about, Old Testament? And if we, if you say, oh, you know, the books, you know, of uh, Genesis to Malachi, they'd be like, I'm pretty sure they'd probably be so furious, they wouldn't, they'd probably kick you out. <laughs> they, How dare you call that Old Testament? That is ours. That's the script. That's the Holy Scriptures. That is our scripture. That's all they had for scripture. That was their scripture. But Marcion called it the Old Testament, according to, you know, this is what, um, this is what, uh, you know, it, it is, um, people have, how, how should I say it? People have gleaned that from history. So Marcin was the first one as far as we know of, to compile a New Testament and to include Paul into it. He didn't, in, he didn't include James or anything else, no other books, you know, not 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, no other Gospels, not the book of Revelation, nothing like that, uh, just the uh, letters of Paul. So 
Um, it really is a troublesome uh, fact of history. And your question here, was there a shift in the history of Christianity? Yes, there was. Beginning with pretty much Marcion, uh, that shift was what I call the greatest schism. You know, we heard about the, the great schism, which, you know, the, the, the schism between, you know, the, the church divided, you know, and the, the Orthodox went, went their way and the Roman Catholic went their way. So uh, they call that the great schism. But back in the second century, when the Jewish believers went one way, like the Ebionites and so on and so forth, and then the Marcionites went the other way, or the or the the anti-Jewish quote unquote Christians went another way. When when the Jewish elements of Christianity were torn out of it and the Jewishness was ripped ripped apart from it where it because back in the days of the book of Acts they all worshiped together in the synagogue you had the, you have the Pharisees you have the Jews you have the you have uh, Peter you know James uh, and the elders of the church they were all part it was all the same religion it was all the same religion it was first century Judaism true, Christianity, meaning Christian uh, Christianity, meaning the true um, practice, belief and practice in the teachings of Jesus, and following Him as an example, that was that's that was Judaism back in the day, but in the second century, beginning the late beginning in the late first century, but in the in the second century, it really started to to go bad is when the the greatest schism happened between the Jews and the Christians. And thanks to someone like Marcion, you know, so, um, and using a lot of the teachings of Paul as well to be very anti-Judaic. Uh, Martin Luther p- picked up on that as well, uh, unfortunately. So very good question, Pat. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Pat says, almost every church service I have attended, Paul is placed above the disciples and at times above Jesus in the serpent. Yeah, it's and that is the truth. Absolutely. This is why I say they should they should call themselves Paulians and not Christians. They put they put Paul over Christ. They do. I know they they would certainly deny it if you told them that. If you if you said that to them, they would deny that, but they really do. They put the teachings of Paul over the teachings of Christ. So they shouldn't call themselves Christians anymore, Christ, Christians, but they should call themselves Paulians because they follow Paul, at least their interpretation of Paul, more than they follow Jesus. Thank you, Pat. Awesome observation you have there. Yeah, Alan says it's terrible. Absolutely. Andrew says, I want to learn more about the formation of the Bible and finding true Christianity. Where can I start? Well, uh, it's a long journey. I'll tell you that. It is a long journey because it is very... I'll tell you right now, because I have been searching and researching... Um that topic for decades. I even bought a, I even got a book like it's a, th- I don't have it around on me right now, but I mean, it's in another location, but I have a thick book about like, a, it's about, it's supposed to be about the, the history of the Bible. So I'm thinking, okay, it's going to teach me how, how the Bible came to be. It, it doesn't <laughs> because it, the, well, first of all, um, I would say, Know your Bible canons, like familiarize yourself with the different churches and their different Bible canons, not Bible versions, Bible canons, the the books that they include in their Bibles, right? So there are, um, I think there's at least seven different Orthodox churches 
seven different Orthodox churches, and each one has their own Bible canon. Like each one has different books within their Bible. So each one of those churches has a different history of the formation of their Bible. The Roman Catholic uh, Church as well has a different history of the formation of their Bible. And the Protestant, the Protestant, um, I shouldn't, I can't say denomination, but you know what I mean. The Protestants, they have uh, a different history too. It really is, you can't put your finger on a person, a time when the Bible was formed. It was, it, it was something that, that began pretty much with Marcion. Okay. So before that they had the Septuagint, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really, as far as I understand, it wasn't really put in a Bible form. Um, like I have this, like a Septuagint here, but um, in this, you know, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text uh, that started, uh, they started to translate the Septuagint in about 203, uh, 250 BC um, and it took a few hundred years to get, um, to get it all translated. But that's not really a Bible. Um, so the formation of a Bible, I would say, started with what Polycarp called the son of Satan. And uh, so Marcion, again, took the letters, the epistles of Paul with Luke, put it together, called it the New Testament, and he canonized that in a way it's like, okay, no other, this is like Holy Scripture and everything else is to be rejected. Okay, it was that kind of man mentality. Very much like Protestants today in their 66 book Bible. And so, again, Marcin, Marcin was denounced as being uh, full of the devil, possessed, and even the son of the devil by some of the early church fathers. Not a very good reputation at all. Over the course of time, the leaders of the church um, decided to amend append the, uh, the quote-unquote canon of Marcion, and so they added more books. They added, oh, we're going to add three more Gospels. Over time, we're going to add, you know, we'll add a few more of the, um, you know, Pauline epistles. And then we'll add, oh, we'll take out the uh, Laodicean one because we don't like that. It, it was, it really, it really was an evolution that, that it took over a thousand years. There wasn't, it did not happen by any one church council, did not happen by any one prophet, priest or king or bishop or anybody. It happened over a long period of time where churches just, church leaders just decide. Like the oldest, the oldest Bible known to man, the oldest Bible we have on earth right now, as far as uh, anyone's concerned is uh, the Codex Sinaiticus. Codex Sinaiticus. Um, for those of you who wonder if you want to do a little bit more research on it, uh, let me see here. Codex Sinaiticus. It is spelt like this. Codex S I N. A-I-T-I-C-U-S. It's called that because it was found at the base, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai. Okay, and so this is the oldest Bible known to man. However, this Bible has New Testament books that our Bible doesn't have. It has the Shepherd of Hermas in the New Testament. Thumbs up to that. Shepherd of Hermas should be considered to be just as holy, if not more holy, than any of the epistles of Paul. Let me tell you that. Um, the, the Codex Sinaiticus also has the Epistle of Barnabas in the New Testament. The Codex Sinaiticus also has a different version of the Gospels. The end of the book of Mark is not found. Uh, the, uh, the whole passage from um, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 37, 37 uh, all the way through to John 8, 11, 
is not found. Okay, it is a it's it's a different Bible, but it's it's an older Bible. Um, obviously, they they ran with they they uh, they added a lot more books, you know, than Marcion did. They added they added all the books that we have, plus the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas as well in their New Testament. So um, it's really a convoluted uh, history. You cannot put your finger on one time when, when the Bible was formed. It was formed by man's um, decisions. No, and here's the, here's the most important point. When you're, when you're studying the history of the Bible, the most important point is this. No one in history, from the days of Marcion all the way until today, no one, as far as I'm aware of, no one has ever claimed that God spoke to them and gave them the canon of the Bible. In other words, nobody ever claimed, not even a false prophet arose and said, well, I had a vision in the night and God said, here are the list of 66 books. You're, you're supposed to put it all together and, and slap Holy Bible on the front and that's it. That's the Bible. It's a closed canon. Nobody ever claimed that. That, and even if they did claim it, you, you should contest it, okay? But as far as I know, nobody can. nobody ever claimed that. And that's to show you that the Bible is a work of man and not of God. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about the books in the Bible. I'm talking about the actual formation of the Bible canon. I'm not talking about the contents, but I'm talking about the framework. That's of man. It's very clear. It's not of God. That is one of the most important points we need to realize because human beings have a tendency to always try to form an idol. God knew that back in, in Deuteronomy. That's why he said, I'm not going to show my form because if I do, you guys are going to make a form, you guys are going to make a likeness of me and then you're going to worship it. Even the bronze serpent they had to smash, they had to do away with because people were worshiping it. From the days of Moses. People have a tendency to do this. Taking something that's holy and, and, and carving an idol out of it. And so in the book of uh, 2nd Esdras, it tells us, now this is before the New Testament was formed. In, at least in the narrative. Um, it tells us that there are, there are um, 109 books that is part of the Holy Scriptures. 109 books. That's not even including the New Testament. But you see, if it started out with 109 books, now we have 30, 39 in our quote-unquote Old Testament, the Tanakh. If it started out as 109, you know what happens. Human beings have a tendency to take that block of wood, that 109, and carve it. Well, we'll get rid of this book. We don't like that one. Well, this one here is, is questionable. We'll get rid of that. We're trying to make a perfect canon here. Oh, oh yeah, we don't like uh, the book of Enoch. Uh, you know, that just kind of, uh, we don't like, well, we'll carve that one out of there. Uh, uh, Jubilees, I uh, will carve that one out of there. You know, and, and all, all on down the line. It just, you know, for thousands of years. I heard the Roman Catholic Church is what carved the book of 2nd Ezra out. And of course, the Protestants being a child of the, although a wayward child, of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they adopted the Roman Catholic ca uh, canon, which did not include the book of 2nd Ezra. So, all the way up until recent times, relatively speaking, we have we have a book that has been carved. We have an idol. It's called the Holy Bible, the Bible canon. So to do that kind of research on your own, Andrew, I would say, you know, prayer. Um, 
start with the scriptures again, like um, look at what Second Ezra says about the canon. Look at what the, look at what the Bible itself says about it. Actually, the Bible doesn't even talk about the Bible, if you know what I mean. The Bible doesn't even talk about the Bible. It talks about in like the uh, the book of Deuteronomy says he who adds or or takes away anything from this book basically will be cursed. Um, Deuteronomy chapter four, I believe that is. Uh, so. Um, making the Bible canon basically is actually wouldn't that be like almost ad, like adding to the adding to the Torah, um, the book of uh, Revelation says don't add to or take away from this book, um, but that's not talking about the Bible. That's talking about the book of Revelation. So, I would say study the. Um, the history of the New Testament, especially Marcion's involvement in it, the Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vatic uh, Vaticanus, the Leningrad Codex, and some of the earlier Bibles, like before the 1611 KJV, um, study that, uh, the reasons why, and this is a mystery, basically, the reasons why the Apocrypha was quote unquote, taken out of the Bible. It really wasn't taken out of the Bible because most of the Bibles, if you look at all the different Bible canons, like at least 12 different Bible canons we have in the world today, most of them have the Apocrypha in it. It's just the uh, the uh, Protestant uh, canon that really removes it, prints Bibles without it, basically. Um, and if you look into the reasons why, it's... It's very, very unclear. You know, we have everything from, well, some, you know, uh, well, they didn't think that the Apocrypha was, uh, you know, uh, compatible with, with the rest of Scripture, which I don't think that's a very good argument at all. I think it is. Um, and then you got the argument that it was all just a social experiment hundreds of years ago. It's like, well, let me see. If we print Bibles... Without the Apocrypha in it, are we going to sell as much as we do with the Apocrypha in it? It's like, we'll take this two by four, the real two inch by four inch, and we'll just shave it down. Are we going to sell, are we going to sell the, sh this, the same amount of two by fours if we shave it off here and shave it off there? Cut off here, cut off there. So I'll tell you, it's not that clear. But it, it, it's it's something that I think you can say with a relative degree of certainty that it's not of God that a Bible canon is is or was ever created. Thank you, Andrew, for that question. It's a very good question. Billy says shalom. Shalom, Billy. Good to see you. Voice of One, have you read Nicodemus or Barnabas? Yes, I have. I am Iron Man says, Shalom and howdy, brothers and sisters. Bless y'all. Shalom and howdy. Good to see you. Pat says, thank you for answering my question. Well, thank you for asking, Pat. I appreciate it. Um, says, then critical thinking brings me to this question. Did Jesus come to earth to create a new religion called Christianity? I can say with as much certainty as pretty much anything else, the answer to that is no. Absolutely not. Even he said, I cannot teach anything new. I teach with my father. To, you know, what, 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 what did the father, what was the word of the father? It was the Torah. It was the Tanakh. Um, he never said, I mean, he never, someone might say, well, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. But you, uh, people need to realize that the word church in the Greek ecclesia uh, is, or excuse me, um, yeah, let me see here. The word church in the Greek is the same word they used in the Greek for synagogues as well back in those days.
yeah, Ecclesia. And also, also, um, the word built, because you see, when, when, when people read the New Testament and they read that Jesus said to Peter, well, upon this rock, I will build my church. Um, they think it means to build something new, but it really doesn't. That same word built. Build. Um, it's uh, oikodomeo. Okay, that same word "build" in the original Greek is the same word that's used uh, that's translated "edify" in other parts of the scripture. Meaning that you know, like for example, that uh, um, you know, one of the things that, that the Word of God does is to edify you, what, you know, or we should edify one another, okay? Like, and, and hopefully, I pray that, you know, what we're talking about tonight is uh, is edifying to everyone that's listening. Does that mean that we're building something new? No. It just means we're building what's already there. We are building upon the faith and the knowledge we already have. And so that's what Jesus was saying when, upon this rock, upon this Petra, I will edify what's already in, in existence, the Ecclesia. If you read it, uh, Acts chapter 7, uh, it says, now let me just, I'll just go there. I'll show you. Um, this is interesting. I think you'll find this interesting. Acts chapter 7. Okay. And let me just look up the word church. Yeah, church here. Acts chapter 7, verse 38 um, <clears throat> this is he, which is talking about Moses. Okay. So in, in context, uh, let me just do the verse, the verse before this is that Moses, which said to the child, children of Israel, prophet, uh, shall the Lord, your God raise up to you unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him, you shall hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him, Moses, in the Mount Sinai. So wait a second. The church was in the wilderness with, with Moses on Mount Sinai. The Ecclesia. Some other translations would, because uh, I think that some of these Christian uh, translators they didn't like they didn't like the word church very much. But the King James has church in here, so some other translations have like um, assembly or uh, congregation, but it's all the same word. It's the same word. It's church. It's the same word that's translated church in all the other parts of of the New yeah. Testament. So the church existed from the beginning. Christianity, it, you know, let me just define what I mean by Christianity, because Christianity today is certainly not the Christianity of what it should be or what, what, what Christianity should be, okay, and how it should be defined is following, uh, going by the teachings of Christ and following his example. Christian Christianity, going by the teachings of Christ and following his example. What are the teachings of Christ? It's Torah, following his example, living Torah. So right from the, one could argue perhaps even Abel, like as in Cain and Abel. Abel was part of the Ecclesia, part of the church. Those, the one who was called out, the one who was holy, the one who was righteous. Because the word a church means um, uh, called out, act. Ecclesia, ecclesia uh, ec, uh, comes from two words, ek and kaleo. Ek means out. Kaleo is where we actually get, it's similar to our word call. Kaleo, call out. So ecclesia means call, the ones who are called out, the people who are called out from the world. You don't live like the world. You don't think like the world. You don't talk like the world. You don't walk like the world. You are different than the world. You are the church, the ecclesia, the holy people of God. So in that sense, 
you could say, one could say Christianity in its truest form existed from the time of Adam and Eve. When Eve was told of the Messiah, of the Christ, his, your seed will bruise the serpent's head. That's Christianity right there. The church was in the wilderness with Moses. It's awesome, Pat. Thank you for, for the question. Again, I like, you know, it's awesome to uh, meet people who are, um, who really use their brains. <laughs> you know, critical thinking is really, it is an essential, it, it is vital uh, in, in your walk with God. Uh, I think that critical thinking is something that God wants us to do. He He gave us a brain to think. He gave us intelligence. He is the God of intelligence. He is the God of all truth. So to, to be critical, to, to think critically and to discern truth from, from all the rest of the trash, that's what God wants us to do. The problem is, most people who call themselves Christians, believers, whatever you want to call them, they don't do that. They just follow the, they just go with the flow of their church, of their denomination. They go, they go with the flow of their pastor or their favorite evangelist or whatever. They don't think for themselves. You know, we, yesterday I showed you, we have t-shirts there that you know, uh, I serve the God of intelligence or think for yourself. It's, 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 it's a basic, um, I'd say a need really in walking with God to think for yourself. Again, thanks a lot, Pat. The Tower Time, shout shalom and howdy, brothers and sisters. Bless y'all. Shalom and howdy, the Tower Time. Welcome, welcome. Blessings, brother. Yes, Angry Mouthy Freak says the American Bible canon is very lacking. Yes, absolutely. Alan says, have you heard of the Codex of James recently found in Syria? No, I have not heard of that, Alan. Sounds very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Billy asked the question, was Martin Luther the last time there were changes to the modern version of the Bible? No, actually, Martin Luther was actually uh, after Martin Luther. Martin Luther wanted to take out, uh, he hated the book of the Epistle of James, talking about James. Uh, uh, he uh, didn't like the Hebrews. Uh, he wanted Hebrews gone, uh, James gone, uh, book of Revelation gone. Um, I mean, Martin Luther's canon was very restrictive. Uh, so the Protestant, his Protestant uh, uh, fruit, I guess you would say, uh, didn't quite go as, 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 uh, as extreme as he did. Um, but I mean, we still have a lot, unfortunately, a lot of still of the, uh, uh, very, very, um, I, I, I dare say evil, um, anti-Semitism of Martin Luther, uh, again, basically a quasi Marcionite. Um, and yeah, the lawlessness of Martin Luther, just lawless doctrine. So it, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a tragedy actually. Martin Luther had a very hard time in, in his in his life, and I think that there could have been a reason for that. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like persecution; it was like oppression of uh, from spiritual forces.
And Angry Mouthy Freak here sends a message to Andrew. Please check the first check out first Enoch and Jubilees. Once you read them, you will know why they kept them out. Angry Mouthy Freak says at least 87 have been kept out. Jubilees goes along with Genesis. Goes with Genesis, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm mentioning first, uh, second Esdras as well. Andrew asked another question: Which Bible is closest? I think it's closest to the actual Greek. If I understand that correctly, it would be like the what you're asking, like the like the untainted the original copies, like the um yeah, the originals. I guess the original. Excuse me. Um, so you got a couple questions here. Let me answer this one at, one at a time. What, which Bible is closest to the actual Greek? Uh, it, it's difficult to answer that because, well, first of all, um, so I understand this to mean that it, you're talking about the New Testament Greek. And the original uh, purest form that it was first written in, um, nobody actually has an, an, an original copy. Nobody has a first copy of any of the books of the New Testament. And there are several thousand manuscript variations of the books of the New Testament that we have today. So um, it's it's definitely been corrupted. I'm not saying it's been corrupted beyond repair or that kind of thing, but it certainly has been corrupted thoroughly. Um, most of those quote unquote corruptions are things that really don't make any difference to the doctrine that is preached in, you know, in those books. Um, but nobody can really tell, like nobody, I don't know of any scholar that would actually say, Hey, you know, I have the original copy of, you know, uh, the Greek from the the book of James, for example, or the, the original uh, Greek from the book of Revelation, that what John actually wrote or something that I know that this is true to, to the original copy. N nobody can do that. Um, it is, you know, and, I, and again, this is something that I think that is by design. I think that this is what God, God actually wants it this way. You think about it throughout history. When the New Testament books were first written, and we are reading them as as best as we can, or the, as much as we can ascertain in the chronological order that they were written, right? So we started yesterday with First Thessalonians, today with Philippians, tomorrow, Lord willing, Galatians. So as much as we can ascertain, this is the order in which these books were written. Um, now you think about it, when they were first written by Paul or any of the other authors of the New Testament, they weren't considered to be scripture. They were not considered to be scripture. They were just, hey, I got a letter in the mail the other day from Paul. Hey, it's a letter from Paul. I mean, scripture to them was the Tanakh. When Paul, if, if, if again, if it's an authentic book, as a lot of scholars don't think so, but like when he wrote to Timothy saying all scripture is given by inspiration of God, you know, um, the scripture he was referring to is the scripture that they, that they had in those days. It wasn't the new Testament. When Paul said, if Paul said to Timothy, um, all scripture is given by inspiration. He was talking in the terms that they understood. He was talking in their language. So we 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 don't we should never ask 
what does this mean to me or what does this mean to you? We should ask, what did this mean to the intended audience of, the, of that time? When we're reading Philippians, we should ask, what did this mean to the Philippians? Because some of the phrases, some of the idioms, some of the figures of speech that are used could mean something completely different way back in that in those days and in that culture as opposed to what we have and what we know today. So you can't really you can't you can't really say I, I can't say which Bible is the closest to the actual Greek. It's uh, I would say my best advice to you, Andrew, on that is to find a Bible that has the most footnotes that tells you about all of these different manuscripts. Find a Bible that really has a lot of footnotes in it. Say, okay, this came from the NU manuscript. This is from the, oh, and so the Mesoretic is different in this way. And, you know, the Septuagint is different in that way or whatever the case is. When you have all those footnotes, that helps you to understand, oh, yeah, there's a lot of variations with this one. Oh, yeah, this whole entire section of the New Testament is not even in the original. Oh, and this word is not in there, and this word was added, and so on and so forth. So that's the real, that's the best, um, the, that's the best uh, you can do as far as uh, trying to swim upstream, so to speak, and get to the pure waters. Again, a very excellent question, Andrew. Thank you for asking. You're, it's This is true. A voice of one. The Ethiopian canon is probably the most accurate. It dates back to Solomon. Yeah, true. I, I agree. Uh, it, you know, when we... When it comes to Bible canons, the Ethiopian Tawahedo Orthodox is, I would say, the most accurate. I wouldn't say it is perfect. <laughs> Again, I don't think the Bible is unbiblical. Okay. The Bible is not of, Bible canon is not of God. But if you want to say which Bible canon is more closer to the way that they looked at it back in those days, 2000 years ago, that's true. The Ethiopian canon, I would say, really fits the profile a lot better than any of the other canons, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Voice of One. Angry Mouthy Freak says his name was not Jesus. Back in those days, uh, definitely, if you were to say, "Hey Jesus," he probably would never. He probably wouldn't. He probably wouldn't respond because nobody pronounced it that way back in those days. Um, yeah, so that in that sense, uh, that's true. So uh, you know, historically speaking. You have Yahushua, uh, again, it's Joshua, is really the, the old English transliteration of the Hebrew, directly from the Hebrew. Joshua, uh, Yahushua or Yahoshua, depending on who you talk to, depending on what Jewish uh, rabbi or, or um, scholar you talk to, that's the original Hebrew um pronunciation of it. Now it did it did as far as I understand historically speaking it did evolve they started it it they started calling people by the, the name of Yahashua or Yahushua they just called them Yeshua or uh Yeshu. Uh just like how you would you would say uh, Josh instead of Joshua. So um, Yeshu in the Greek, Greek the Greek uh, because the the New Testament is written in Greek, 
the Greek, uh, you know, uh, they add, they convert Yeshu into their um, naming convention. So the Greek naming conventions usually, not not always, but uh, many times they add the at they add a, a letter S at the end of the of the name, like Marcus, Lucas, Ananias, um, Cephas. Okay, lots of these uh, names have S at the end. So Yeshu. Yeshu, Yeshu became Yeshus in the Greek. So, and then over the course of time, um, Yeshus, uh, it wasn't again, the, the letter J or the sound of J wasn't in the, you know, wasn't in that vernacular for, for many hundreds of years. It wasn't until relatively, relatively recently, the letter J uh, started appearing in the English language in the J sound. So Jesus became Jesus or Jesus. And so that's how it evolved from Yeshua or Yahushua to Yeshua to Yeshu to Jesus to Jesus. Now, it, I know there are some people who are very, very picky. You know, uh, if you say Jesus, you, you're calling on the wrong God. You're, call, or you're calling on the wrong guy. It's not Jesus. It's just. But um, I think that God has a bigger mind than that. I think that I think that Yeshua has a bigger perception than that. Uh, if people call me uh, Chris instead of Christopher, I answer to it. I've had people call me Christopher. That's not the way I'm used to being pronounced. That's a completely different way of pronouncing it. But I'm not going to be an idiot about it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to respond. If someone says, hey, Christopher, I'm going to say, oh, yeah, oh, hey, what do you want? Hey, you know, so whatever. Eh? I understand you're talking to me, right? Um, somebody might call me Grease. I don't. I'm not all that greasy, but you can call me grease if you want. But I understand what you what you mean. I understand there are different in different dialects, different ways of pronouncing. So God Himself or Jesus or Yeshua, Yeshu, Yesus, Yahushua, Yahweh Shah, doesn't matter how you want to say it. To me, it's like if you say it in spirit and in truth, if you really uh, you know. You say it the best way you know how. I don't think he's going to have a problem with it. I don't think he's going to get his nose out of joint. I wouldn't. All right, so I wouldn't. And there, and then there's other, you know, other languages like yeah, uh, we have uh, again the the, the Greek uh, Jesus. Um, you know, and then you got Spanish, and then you've got uh, you know uh, Arabic. You know, Isa. It's all this. I, th I don't think Jesus said, oh, I'm not going to listen to you because you, you didn't pronounce my name properly. If you look at history of how the Jewish people and the Hebrews pronounce names, there has always been different pronunciations. So I don't think anybody can even tell you exactly how the name of God was pronounced or Jesus was exactly how. I mean, pretty relatively similar. But you look at Judges chapter 12, for example, right? You have the uh, people right within the children of Israel, right within the tribes of Israel, pronouncing the same name completely different ways. Well, I'm not completely different, but Sibboleth versus Shibboleth. They could tell that you're, you're from a different tribe based upon the way you say a different name. But really, the name of somebody is, has nothing to do with how you say it. It has everything to do with the meaning of it. God has hundreds of names. You can say Yeshua has many, many, many names. So the way you pronounce it is really doesn't matter as much. As, I mean, as long as you do it in, with respect, of course, you know, and, and with the best of your knowledge. But it's what the meaning behind it, the spirit of it. The name of a person is more than just sounds. It's more than just phon phonetic sounds that come from your tongue and your lips. It's meaning. It's meaning. Like, for example, where we read in, in uh, talk about the New Testament, talk, uh, who, who was and who is and who is to come. That is actually an unpacked 
translation of the yud he wow he the four letter name of god that's what it means who was who is and is to come that's what it means so basically saying that is actually saying the name of god so it has more to do with meaning than it has to do with just humanly pronounced sounds Anthony asked the question, what led up to or where or were main important factors that led up to the vision slash dream that Solomon had where God told him, you may have whatever you want, and he asked for wisdom? Did God think, did God think he was special? Was it because he was an Israelite because his dad was David, because he was righteous. Why do you think God gave Solomon that dream? Do you think we can recreate the same luck? Um, so I think that I think that God knew what he was going to say. I think that God just gave him, gave him an opportunity to get blessed. And yeah, it had to do with he was David's son. It had to do with his righteousness for sure. It had to do with the, you know, um, his obedience and his adherence to the Torah, at least at that time. So I wouldn't, I, I would, I don't know if I would say it, it would be a good thing to try to recreate the same luck. I know that every, a lot of people want to. Um, I know a lot of people want to. Uh, I, the best you can do is just ask and pray and ask God. You know, if you want to recreate the same luck, if, if put it that way, or you, you want to recreate the same blessing, uh, if you have his heart, if you have Solomon's heart, if you have his blessings, if you you have his selflessness, because that's what it was really all about. It was selflessness. He he wasn't. It wasn't all. He was he was concerned about the people more than himself. He wasn't he wasn't consider considering himself at all. Really, it was all about everyone else. It was all about how much he could serve. You know the people of God. So with that same attitude, I think that it, it would be possible to recreate some degree of that blessing for sure. Thank you for the question, Anthony. I appreciate it. John says, why don't you like the terms Old Testament or New Testament? Well, very good question, John. I appreciate that one too. Very good question. So there's a couple things. It's, it's, it's misleading. It makes it look like there are only two Testaments, where there are many, many Testaments. There are many covenants. So the, the word Testament and the word covenant are interchangeable. Uh, they are basically synonymous and so the new the new covenant is the new testament the new testament is the new covenant the old the old covenant is the old testament the old the old testament is the old covenant but you look at it through the scriptures there are many covenants right you can say there's the covenant of adam there's the covenant of abel there's the covenant of job there's a covenant of abraham there's a covenant of david there's a covenant of uh, jacob there's the covenant of uh, there's so many different covenants there's the covenant of Noah, okay? There are so many different covenants. So to just pack it all together and call it one old covenant, 
it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong to do that because it makes it look like it's one. From Genesis to Malachi, there are many covenants. And sometimes even within one book, you can find many covenants. Genesis, for example, you can find many covenants in one book. So it is misleading. Uh, and also it makes it, it makes people believe that what is written from Genesis to Malachi is not that important because it's the old, it's old. we got the new stuff now. Um, and that's also very misleading. It really de it really degrades the scriptures that were so highly honored and respected by the early 12 and by Jesus himself, and even by Paul. As we read through Paul's letters, you'll see how Paul refers to the scriptures. Like we just read a little bit, a little, a little example there earlier on how he, he, uh, he drew from the Tanakh to, uh, to support his doctrine. He does that all the way through all of his epistles. He draws, he quotes the Tanakh, he quotes the Torah, the prophets, to substantiate his doctrine. Even, even Paul himself, I think, would probably be outraged at the, at the idea that you would call the Tanakh the Old Testament. Now, that said, as per Jeremiah 31, as, you know, depending on how you want to interpret and apply it, Hebrews chapter 8, uh, there, there is a covenant out of the many covenants that is the that is old, okay. But the covenant is not the word of God. I mean, what I mean is, let me rephrase that because I'm pretty sure a lot of people would misunderstand me. The covenant, a covenant, is in the word of God, but it's not the word of God in and of itself, in the sense that. Let's say um, the a covenant is now expired. That's still in the quote unquote word of God, and that's still part of the word of God. But that particular covenant is expired, and now it's just there for us to uh, to learn from or to to know of the history of it. Um, so you know, it's it's just very misleading. Very misleading. The Tanakh, the Law and the Prophets, inc include many uh, covenants, many which are eternal. Many which are, are eternal. And again, that's another reason why I hate to say old covenant because it's it's within that scope of books we have in we have eternal covenants and the eternal Word of God and the eternal Torah. So it's not really old. It's always new. Thank you, John, for asking. Anthony asked a question. I'm gonna I'm gonna take this question. Then I'm, I'm gonna read the uh, Philippians. Then I'll get back to the uh, to the live chat. Any, any questions that specifically for me, just please put at Christopher in the live chat like Anthony did here. So the question is, what do you think it means to bless the nation of Israel in Numbers 24, 9? Whoever blesses Israel will be saved. Whoever curses Israel will be cursed. That's a very good question. The answer to that question would be wrapped up in one question. Who is Israel? Who is Israel? Um, and I think the answer, and we actually, you know, I, I, I re recommend, uh, you, Anthony, listen to, um, we had, uh, Dr. Jason Sta Staples with us, uh, a few weeks ago, actually, I think it'd probably be a few months ago by now. Um, and, uh, we spoke about the idea of Israel, who Israel is in, in, uh, in the scriptures, uh, this is his book. Uh, I would actually recommend it if you really want to dig into the to the idea of Israel and who it, Israel really is. To give you a very nutshell version of it, yes, Israel would be the biological descendants of 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also Israel, the people of Israel are those who are in covenant relationship with God. Even if you're not biologically a Jew or anything like that, you're still considered to be Israel if you are in covenant relationship with God. But again, check out that video. Um, it's still up. It's basically more or less in the archives now in uh, on, on the channel here. So check it out with Jason Staples. Thank you, Anthony, for asking. So let's get back into Philippians. Again, this is awesome. Philippians chapter 2, when Paul said to his buddies in Philippi, So then, my beloved, even as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputes that you may become blameless. Again, look at, look at how Paul talks here. Uh, he wants you to be blameless. A lot of, a lot of Christians would say uh, it's, it's not possible to be, to be blameless. By the way, blameless means without fault, means you obey God. Fault, like, you, don't, you don't stumble on one point. That's what blameless means, really. You, know, you don't have fault because if you stumble, if you disobey, you, you're at fault. Blameless means without fault, without blame. Nobody can blame you for breaking any of the commandments so that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without blemish. Okay. A lot of people, a lot of Christians would say, well, only Jesus is the lamb without blemish. No, no. Paul at least commanded those uh, of his friends in Philippi to also be without blemish in the midst of a crooked and, per and perverse generation among whom you are seen as lights in the world, holding up the word of life, that I may have something to boast in the day of Christ. So Paul is looking forward to, to judgment day where he can say, okay, okay, Yeshua, uh, look what I did. Look, what, look, at, uh, look at the fruit that I pr I'm producing here for you. That I didn't run in vain nor labor in vain. Yes, and if I am poured out on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I rejoice and rejoice with you all in the same way you also rejoice and rejoice with me. But I hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to send Timothy to you soon, uh, that I also may be cheered up when I know how you are doing. For I have no, no one else like-minded who, who will truly care about you, for they all seek their own not the things of Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him that as a child serves his father, so he who served served with me in in the further in furtherance of the good news. Therefore I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself also will come shortly. But I counted it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and your apostle and servant of my need, since he longed for you all and was very troubled because you have heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, nearly to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only him, not on him only, but on me also, that I might not have sorrow on sorrow. I have sent him, therefore, the more diligently that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may, I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all joy and hold such in honor because for the work of Christ, he came near to death, risking his life to supply that which was lacking in your service, service toward me. Now we go to Philippians chapter 3. Now this is one, if I can say it, maybe it's like my grandmother was, one doozy of a chapter, okay? This is righteousness through faith, really. Okay, so let's, let's check this out. By the way, this is not what Paul wrote. This is what the interpreters wrote. Verse 1, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me... Indeed, is not tiresome, but for you, it is safe. Beware of the dogs. Okay, let's talk about cultural context here. 
what does this mean? Beware of the dogs. Well, you see, back in the days of Paul, in that culture, uh, some of the Gentiles were considered to be dogs. Okay. So when Paul said that, he was talking about that. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evildoers, because uh, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the circumcision. So what is he talking about here? False circumcision and we are the circumcision. This is speak for, this is like, this is lingo for Jew versus fake Jew. Fake Jew versus real Jew. This is what he's, this is really what it means. For we are the real Jews who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If any other man thinks he has uh, confidence in the flesh, I I yet more. <laughs> this is really weird for him to go on talking like this, but listen to this. Circumcised on the eighth day. So he goes like basically from the day he was born. Uh, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew. Like he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting. Now this word here in the original is ecclesia, the church, the assembly. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. What? What? I thought you said, Paul, that no one is justified by the works of the law. Hmm. Paul, are you contradicting yourself here? I thought you said nobody is found blameless or nobody is, is, is justified by the works of the law. Now, here again, there are many, many kind of things like this we're going we're gonna to run into. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a doozy. and talk about doozies. Tomorrow is going to be a big one. We're going to run into a few of these things that con that Paul seems to. I'm, you know I mean? I'm, 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 I'm leaving the door open here when I say seems to. Seems to be directly contradicting himself. Wait till tomorrow. I mean, I'll, I, there's going to be some good ones I'm going to show you. But this is one example. Okay, so he says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless, without fault. In other words, he didn't stumble in one point. He's, 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 he hasn't, uh, you can't blame him for disobeying any of the commandments. He, he's, he's good with it all. He's in line with everything. Again, put that up with what he said when, you know, uh, you cannot um, be justified by the works of the law, as he said in Romans. So, verse 7, however, what things were gained to me, these things I have counted lost for Christ. Yes, most certainly. And I count all things to be lost for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and count them nothing, uh, nothing but refuse, uh, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is of, excuse me, that which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So notice the way, he, there's so much here he says, okay? So much he says here. Um, where are we going to start? So, he found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that is, uh, that which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith. So um, again, so he's he's starting, and this is probably, this could be the correct um, chronology of these letters, like First Thessalonians first, and then Philippians, and then Galatians, because it sounds like as he's talking here, he's ramping up to a Galatians pitch here. 
an, uh, an anti-Torah pinch the way he's, he's starting uh, in on, uh, on this. So um, he says he's, he doesn't have a righteousness of his own, but that, w- uh, that which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. So this word faith, again, uh, is uh, from the Hebrew word amuna, which means faithfulness or fidelity, which also carries the air of obedience. Okay. So what does he mean here? Now, most Christians would say, well, they, what he means here is that we don't have to obey the law anymore. We just, we're just, just faith in Christ. That's all. That's our righteousness. But does he really mean that? Because faithfulness to Christ is obedience to the Torah. Faithfulness to Yeshua is obedience to the Torah. Because Yeshua taught Torah, he lived Torah. So you want to be faith faithful, you want to have fidelity to Christ, that would mean that you're living to the Torah. So what's he, what's he trying to say here? One could possibly argue that he's saying that he's not doing it. Uh, basically, he's not obeying the law just f- through uh, by himself, but rather he's obeying the law through the teachings of Christ. Okay? One could say that. But Paul being Paul, and this is one thing that you'll notice about Paul as, as we get deeper and deeper into this, he is a very confusing man. I said that once a few years ago, and somebody said, oh, no, he's not. He's very easy to understand. Uh, I wouldn't be so confident about that. He seems to contradict himself many, 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 many times throughout his epistles. And uh, talk about like weird, some of the things he says is weird. Talk about like, you know, when we were reading the Gospel of Thomas, some of the things that, that the Gospel of Thomas says is pretty weird. But some of the things that Paul said was weird too. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, what? So in other words, Paul, you're saying that you don't know him now? So in other words, Paul, you're saying you don't know Jesus. And you want to know Jesus through being faithful to him or being faithful to Christ. Um, That way you can come to know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings uh, becoming conformed to his death. If by any means, if, notice, Paul's not very presumptuous here, which is a good thing, okay? He's saying, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. In other words, Paul is saying, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Remember, this is the same book where he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And here he's saying, if I may attain to that. By the way, the resurrection, like that's basically the final. That's that's the that's the last piece of the salvation puzzle, right? And he's saying, if I may, if by any means I may may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not only that, I not excuse me that not that I have already obtained. Or am already made perfect, but I press on as if so I may take hold of that which also I was taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Now, again, it seems to be that he is kind of walking back on it on his word here. Not that I've been that I've already obtained what? Well, salvation, basically, the resurrection of the dead, or that you would know him that you know Jesus, not that you would be made perfect after you already said that you're blameless. Verse 13, Brothers, I don't regard myself as yet having taken hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before. In other words, I'm not stuck in the past. I'm moving on. I'm I'm growing, which is good. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Well, good. Amen. 
I hope you made it there, Paul. Lest us, uh, excuse me, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, think this way. If in anything you think otherwise, God will also reveal that to you. Nevertheless, to the extent that we have our, um, to the extent that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So this this again is kind of like a, this is a Torah concept, where it's like uh, you do what you can do to the extent that we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule as much as you can. Brothers, be imitators, therefore, of, uh, together of me, and note those who walk this way, even as you have uh, you have us for an example. Now, remember. Let me just stop here for example for for a minute. Now, remember, n- apart from the letter, uh, one letter, apart from the letter of First Thessalonians to those in Thessalonica. They didn't have any other New Testament book. In, in fact, the Philippians probably didn't even have 1 Thessalonians. This is all they had. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is all they had. So in that context, you say, when Paul says to, the, to his friends in Philippi, be imitators together of me, Because they had no one else, right? They had no one else. They didn't have anything else. They had no other books, nothing apart from, you know, perhaps the scriptures, you know, the again, the Tanakh in the synagogues. Um, But be imitators together of me and note those who walk this way, even as you have us for an example. For many walk of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping as enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Interesting. Why would he say that? Perhaps in that culture, they did a lot of maybe over over feasting and whose glory is in their shame. Wow. I tell you, do we have, don't we see a lot of this today? Who think about earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven from where we also wait for a savior. So again, it's kind of a little bit more like his um, his First Thessalonians um, letter, where he's always talking about waiting for him. He's coming soon. You know, we will be you know we'll be alive. You know, when he comes back, and we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds. Yada yada yada. For our citizen, our citizenship is in heaven, from where we also wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change the body of our humiliation to be conformed to the body of his glory, according to the working by which he is able even to this, even to subject all things to himself. Philippians chapter four. Therefore, my brothers, beloved and longed for my joy and crown. So stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I exhort Eudia, Yodia, excuse me, and exhort Syntyche, Syntyche, to think the same way in the Lord. Yes, I beg you also, true yoke yoke fellow, help these women, for they labored with me in the good news, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So he's pretty confident about his fellow workers, but not so much about himself. It makes me think as I read this verse, verse three. It makes me think about some of the some of the uh, very extreme, you would say, extreme fundamentalist Christians that say every single word of of uh, Paul's letters is is God speaking to you today. Now, I'd be a little bit sarcastic here, a little bit kind of poking at at people that would believe that way, and I would say, well. If every single word that Paul wrote is actually God speaking to you today, then you better go find these women. Because God says, again, excuse my sarcasm, but I have to expose some of this way of thinking. Uh, because God says, uh, yes, I beg you also, true yoke, yoke fellow, help these women, uh, Yodia and Syntyche. You better go find them. If you believe that these are the words of God for you. 
Verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. See, this is again talking about the coming of the Lord. Um, Again, very similar to the first Thessalonians. This is probably why a lot of scholars believe that Philippians was written very close to first Thessalonians. Uh, apart from also the way that he addressed them, and he didn't call himself an apostle, just like how he, he did not call himself an apostle in 1 Thessalonians either. Verse 6, In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will God guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, Whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is any praise, think about these things. The things which you learned, received, heard, and saw in me, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your thought for me, in which you did indeed take thought, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect to lack, but or for, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content in it. I know how to be humbled, and I know also how to abound. In everything and in all things, I have learned the secret both to be filled and to be hungry, both to abound and to be in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, the beautiful, beautiful verse that all the Christians love to quote. I can do all things who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Awesome. Obey the Torah. Oh, I can't. oh no, I can't do that. Only Jesus can do that. Oh, really? Luke chapter 1, verse 6. It says Zechariah and Elizabeth both obeyed all the commandments and ordinances. They both walked in all of the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Blameless. Talking about blameless? Blameless. If you can't do it, you are at you are actually if you're saying that you cannot obey the commandments of God, you are actually indirectly calling God a liar and a tyrant because he said you can. He said it's easy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. He's, he commanded you. You think he's a tyrant? You think he's an abusive father to command you to do things that you can't do and then curse you for not doing it? That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not the God of Yeshua. I would say, yes, you can do th all th things through Christ that strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens you, especially obeying the word of the Father, which is the Torah. You can do it. However, verse 14, however, you did well that you shared in my affliction. You yourselves also know, you Philippians, that in the beginning of the Good news, the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no assembly shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again to my need. Not that I seek for the gift, but I seek for the fruit that increases to your account. But I have all things and abound. I am filled, having received from Epaphroditus the things that, that came from you, a sweet, swell, a, a sweet smelling fragrance, an acceptable and well-pleasing sacrifice to God. My God will supply every need of yours according to, the, to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are, are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. Hmm. So Paul is close to Caesar. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 
Beautiful. Beautiful. And that concludes our reading of, of uh, the epistle of the Philippians, the epistle of Paul to the Philippians tonight. And that includes our reading for tonight. So let me just dive into the live chat here with you guys and see what we have. And I know we have a lot of activity there. So I, I sorry, I can't get to everything, but I'll get to as many as I can here. The Great Deception, did you hear? They found the outline of the tabernacle at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. No, I didn't hear that. I did not hear that. Again, very interesting. Reminds me a lot of, you know what I'm going to say, the Israelite Samaritan version of the Torah, as, as that has great differences between the... Um, that and the Masoretic text in regards to those, those very mountains. So uh, very interesting. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Alan, I appreciate it. Alan says, I have no problem saying Jesus. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a, it's just a, it's just a, it's a form, a, you know, it's a transliteration of a Greek word that's a transliteration of a Hebrew word that is a short form of another Hebrew name. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of downstream, but hey, you know, I think that he is, he knows exactly what you mean when you, uh, yeah, Jesus in Spanish. Yeah. Ophi says, do you believe that Talmud tradition should be taught among the believers of Yeshua? Very good question. Um, some of it, okay, so Yes, it should be taught as much. It should be observed as much as. Well, let me just say, put it. Let me say this way. I don't think it's any problem observing it to the, as long as it doesn't uh, contradict what the Torah and the prophets say. You know, some of it, you know, perhaps would. Uh, you know, as Yeshua said, you know that they they. Uh, uh, some of the religious people in his day, um, they held the traditions of men over the commandments of God. And so the Talmud does have some of the traditions of men in it. So um, I think it's certainly something that is worth studying. And uh, yeah, I just, I mean, take it, to, you know, test all things for sure. Test all things for sure. Thank you very much, Ophis, for asking. I appreciate it. German, the J sounds like Y. Well, like Ophis asked the question, well, was Yeshua preaching against Talmudic traditions? Like, for example, the washing of hands, you know, he uh, or the uh, the thing about, you know, whatever you say is korban, you, whatever you, uh, you could give to your mother or your father, you say it's korban, a gift to God. And it's like you, you break. Yeah. So, I mean, certain, certain Talmudic traditions, I would say, uh, are definitely um, debatable for sure in that in that sense. I would stick with as much as possible. I mean, not to be a not as not as extreme as to be a Karaite, but rather uh, t 
to stick as much as possible to what the Torah says and the uh, the, the prophets. Uh, and I know there's a lot of things. There's is, there's no problem going like outside of that. Um, a lot of Christians actually go outside of the Bible. They don't even know it. But I mean, like Matthew chapter 23, for example, Matthew chapter 23, uh, Yeshua taught his disciples um, and actually his entire audience. He said uh, that they should do and observe. Now, that's a big one. Do and observe everything that the Pharisees teach you to do and observe. What does the, te- the Pharisees teach you to do and observe? The Talmud. All right. So, um, again, in context, it would be it would be the things in the Talmud that would not be against the more authoritative um, books or sources. Jordan says, well said and shalom, brother. Thank you, Jordan. Shalom, Jordan. Good to see you. Jordan says, living it out is more important in the long run than pronouncing it, calling him Yeshua. I'm a a sandwich. It isn't very respectful either. I've I've sadly witnessed. Um, Yeah, so see a lot of people, especially in the West, because of our culture, uh, a lot of people are more prone to the way things sound, like when they pick names for their children, for example. Oh, I like that name. It's, that, I just like the sound of that name. I just like that name. But they don't even say, so, well, what does, that, what does that name mean? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so you, you, you choose a name based upon its sound instead of the meaning of it. Whereas in the scriptures, we see the opposite. The names are chosen based upon the meaning, not the sound of it. Now, it doesn't matter how you pronounce the name in a sense, as long as I mean as long as, as long as people know what the meaning is, what you're trying to say, what the, what the what the name conveys. That's what it's all about. You know, it, like, not so much nowadays, but in you know more uh, you know in the earlier days, uh, names your name meant everything. Uh, it, your occupation was was in your name. You know, your repu- your reputation was in your name. Um, and I'm talking about more than just, again, sounds, phonetic sounds produced from a human mouth, but rather the meaning of those sounds. That's really what it's all about. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, Alan says, the Christians say he taught against Torah. Yeah, like where? I had someone say that to me. He taught against Torah. I'm like, where did he teach against Torah? Well, he, he said, you should, he, he, uh, You heard it said eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I say, I say love your enemies. Said, That's not against Torah. That's actually Torah. He was just putting, he was just sorting out the hypocrisy, right? They were, they were, they were not loving their enemies like the Torah commanded them and using eye for eye, tooth for tooth as an excuse. They were hiding behind those other commandments to break, uh, to break the Torah. So yeah, it's just that I think a lot of Christians, they don't know the Torah when they say this kind of thing. If they knew it, if they study it, then they'll say, oh yeah, I see. He actually taught the Torah. Actually, I said that one of the, um, uh, one of the leading, um, rabbis in the world that that uh, actually uh, serves in a, in a ministry that is against Christianity um, he said I've heard it said heard I've heard him said I don't know how, how many times and I actually played it several months ago here on on a video where he said um, that he believes that Yeshua, could have been a, a a good Torah observant Jew. He has no problem with that. But Paul, and he goes in, he goes in on a rant about Paul, and it was Paul and the interpretation of Paul that really spoiled the whole thing for him. You know, so 
Christianity is really all about Paul, not so much about Jesus. Wow, awesome testimony, Alan. Uh, I lost everything. I was homeless. Now I am a property owner, 2.5 acres because of the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. Wow, amazing. I work hard. I'm 60, do construction. I am blessed in the work of my hands. Amen, amen. Very awesome. Thank you for sharing and uh, praise God for that. He said, now I'm at the top of where I can go in construction, a foreman. The only place I can go more is the owner of a company. This happened in four years. He's saying the blessings of the Torah are true. The curse of the Torah is true. The word of the Lord is true. The Torah of yud heh wow heh is true. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And Vinny says, uh, yeah, pray. Uh, Amen, Alan. Praise Yahweh. Yes, amen. Angry Mouthy Freak says, through the Messiah, I am capable of all things. Amen to that. Alan, hallelujah. Angry Mouthy Freak says, I believe the synagogue of Satan uh, made up the name Yeshua, which I believe means may his name be forgotten in Yiddish. Yeah, there I, I have heard a few rabbis uh, bring this out before where it's like Yeshu is an acronym. Um, I do not believe that. And that's because historically speaking, the, the name Yeshu was used commonly back in those days. And I think that it's just somebody somewhere down the line um, just made up an acronym, like made up an acronym for it, just like how people do today. They have a, you have a name and you can make anything. You can take, uh, you know, a you know, four or five letter name and make it mean anything positive or negative. So uh, I, I don't see any... Um, any good evidence for that. So I don't, I, I don't really follow that. Um, but the, uh, again, the anti-Christian rabbi that I was referring to earlier also spoke a, along that, uh, those lines. And, um, uh, and even he, uh, he, if there's anybody that would, that would want to, um, attack Jesus or attack Christians or attack the name of Jesus or the name of Yeshu, it would be him, okay? He would want to do it because he he dedicates his life to doing this stuff, and uh, you know he's a scholar in and of his own right. And even he said um, that that theory is is just a theory, and there's is, there's no uh, there's no proof of it. Alan says, when, there's, when they sit in Moses' seat reading Torah, yeah. Referring to Matthew 
Okay, um, so that that wraps it up. Um, tomorrow we will get into the highly debatable book and the probably the. <laughs> If I can say this, I've, I've said this several times before, I'll say it again. The, the book of Galatians is a dumpster fire of theology, at least in the sense that it is commonly interpreted. Let me just put it that way. At least in the sense that is it is commonly interpreted uh, and in the way that Paul wrote it and of all the questionable things that is said there. Uh, it is probably one of the, if I can say there is a worst book in, in the New Testament, it probably would be that one. Um, however, there are some good stuff. There are some really good stuff in the book of Galatians as well. So I'm not going to say, and I would not say throw out the book of Galatians. Um, I wouldn't say I throw out any of the New Testament books like, uh, like Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Re Reformation, says to throw out so many books of the New Testament. I wouldn't say that. I would say that uh, read it with, with knowledge, right? Test all things. Be like the Bereans of Acts chapter 17. Test what Paul said with the Tanakh, because that's what they did. They tested it with the Tanakh. They didn't have New Testament scripture. They had the law and the prophets and the holy writings to test Paul's theories and his doctrine. So we're going to get into, into it, Lord willing, tomorrow. The book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is one of the toughest books to go through as a Torah observer. But we're going to do it by the grace of God, by the strength that he gives us. Amen. All right. Alan says, thank you, brother. Much love and blessings to you all. Thank you, Alan. Much love and blessings multiplied to you. Thank you for your fellowship and your questions and your comments. Ofi says, Toda Rabba for the reading and shalom. Well, you're welcome and shalom multiplied back to you. Good to see you, Ofi's Blessings. Uh, Vinny says, thank you, Christopher. Many blessings to everyone. Shalom. Thank you, Vinny. Blessings multiplied back to you and your household. Alan says, because of evangelical dispensationalists have taught mainly Paul. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. All right, guys. Good to see you. Um, Jordan says, I do my best to help. Well, we appreciate you, Jordan. Love you, brother. And uh, you guys, all you guys are awesome. I appreciate you guys. Make sure if you're new here, make sure you're, you're subscribed. Make sure you don't lose the channel. Uh, make sure you uh, come back tomorrow uh, as we are going to get into probably one of the highly, the most debatable, the most, the kind of the roughest book a Torah observer would encounter. And that would be the book of Galatians. But we're going to get into it tomorrow, Lord willing. So make sure you don't miss it. Same time, same place, 7 p.m. Eastern. That is 7 p.m. New York time. We'll see you then. Blessings to you guys. You guys are awesome. You guys are world changers. Love you. And I'll see you again tomorrow. As always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you. And give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen. See you guys tomorrow.